Ladies, one of your biggest complaints to me and one of my biggest complaints I would have to say too in my lifetime is insomnia. Many, many of you, I would say majority of you are not having a good night's sleep due to perimenopause, menopause, or just simply life in general. It is a growing epidemic, and with me today is a sleep expert that's going to shed a completely different light on what could be causing your insomnia. And so this is just groundbreaking to me because I have never heard these things before, so I wanted to get this woman on to share the information with you. And this is Dr. Stasha Gomanak. She received an MD degree in 1983. Her neurology residency was done at the Harvard affiliated Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. She practiced neurology in the San Francisco Bay Area from 1991 to 2004, then moved with her husband, Tyler, to Texas. Starting in 2004, she began to dedicate more of her practice to the treatment of sleep and sleep disorders. In 2012 and 2016, she published two pivotal articles about the global struggle with worsening sleep, the possible causes and solutions related to vitamin D deficiency and the intestinal microbiome. In 2006, she retired from her office practice to have more time to teach. She currently divides her time between right sleep coaching sessions for private individuals and teaching other clinicians the right sleep method of sleep repair. You can find Dr. Gomanak at drgomanak.com. And the link for that will be in the show notes. So welcome, Dr. Stasha. It's so good to have you here. Thank you, Karen, for inviting me. It's my pleasure. I love to talk about sleep because I am a horrible insomniac, which I've, I feel like I've gotten it under control, but I was on sleep medication for over 10 years and I've recently switched off of that and I still have to drug myself, unfortunately, but I take uh, THC drops and that seems to work really well for me, but I hate that I have to get stoned <laughs> Just fall asleep. It's terrible. It's definitely better than prescription medication. So I am super excited to have you here to tell us what you have discovered in your practice, what that is causing this epidemic. So why did you fall into, like you were in this, just a normal medical practice and suddenly you were like, okay, I need to dive deep into sleep. So what, what brought you there? What happened originally was that one of my head, I, I had about half of my practice in daily headaches. So we, you and I just started discussing headache and how common that is in young, otherwise healthy and menopausal, perimenopausal women. Yeah. But I had about half my practice in daily headache sufferers. And one of them back in 2005 demanded a sleep study after she had taken my drugs and they didn't work. And, um, and she had sleep apnea. She wasn't overweight. She didn't have a fat neck. At the time, we were not doing any sleep studies on young, healthy females. And she had sleep apnea, and which didn't interest me at all at the time. But she put on a CPAP mask and then came back about two months later and her headaches were gone. And for me, that was just crazy. I mean, she can't put her hair in a ponytail because her scalp hurts and she's strapping on this mask at night. Like, how is that a placebo effect? This is a, this is a torture device and yet it's making her better. Yeah. So because I had already gotten deeply into the genetics of migraine. So migraine is a genetic disorder that has to do really with how the pain cells turn on and off. Um, I don't believe that the blood vessels are the major factor in headache. I believe it's a brain stem problem where the actual nerve cells that perceive pain turn on spontaneously instead of waiting for someone to say, ouch, I just hit my head, message goes in. This part of the brain stem that happens to be right next to the sleep switches turns on by itself and causes your head to hurt because these cells are too excitable. The genes that cause that are about how we move little positive and negative charges in. So they're kind of about the electricity of how the neurons turn on and off. So because I'm into that, I'm into these genetic markers, I'm thinking, well, she's just blowing air up her nose. Like, how would that make these switches go back to the off position? And instead, I think, you know, 
all of these women who have these mutations, they didn't always have headaches. No, that I didn't. That means they were born with that mutation. Okay, right. they had that mutation when they first popped out and then they present at certain ages, frequently when menstruation starts or around. So there are things, there are periods of time in your life where the brain is able to shore up that potential weakness and operate normally. So then the next question is, oh, I have four drugs. In retrospect, our drugs that have worked are sodium channel stabilizers, which are seizure medicines, calcium channel stabilizers, which are blood pressure medicines. They were all the medicines for migraine are mostly found by accident. We don't have a really good coverage mm -hmm. on them. But when looking at it that way, I thought, oh, well, maybe her brain is just making these drugs that it, the brain's making chemicals and those chemicals stabilize her little cells and the, her little cells wake up in the morning and they're in the, I don't have a headache mode. And they wait until like they're supposed to until somebody hits you in the head and then they send a pain message. Okay. So with that in mind, I thought, well, all of these women are always complaining of the same things. I can't remember anything. I'm in a bad mood and I can't sleep, you know, and they don't, they don't come in with that complaint because they have two little kids, you know, and their two-year-old is waking up in the middle of the night. So they're not stupid. They know if they come in and say, I can't sleep, and you have a four-year-old and two-year-old, I'm going to say, well, what do you think, you know? There... So they don't even consider that they could have a sleep disorder as the primary cause of their daily headache syndrome, and no one else was either. Frankly, at the time that I started with that, no one was writing about the link between sleep deprivation and daily headache. That is now published and lots of other people thinking about it. The problem is that we have a very narrow view of how it is you don't sleep well. So first for five years, I do a bunch of sleep studies on young, healthy females, which was kind of weird because the, the Reports I would get back would say no significant apnea. So the first gal had apnea. She stopped breathing. She wore a CPAP mask. But all the rest of them, you know, maybe one in every 12 or 15 would have some apnea. But most of them said no significant apnea, which leaves me thinking, well, otherwise they look just the same. You know, they're both 32. They both have two kids. They both have daily headache. This one stops breathing and this one doesn't. And after about a year, my pulmonologist who's reading the study said, I don't know if you've noticed this, but you're sending a population that's very different than our usual population that comes for sleep studies. Okay, so this was in about 2007 and eight. And he said, I don't know if you noticed this, but most of your uh, patients don't have any REM sleep. Oh my gosh. And I was like, that's not on the report. And he said, I know. I was like, wait a minute. This, they have a specific pattern that you've noticed, but you don't put it on the report. What's up with that? So then I start to have to learn how to read the second and third page, which details for you. A lay person can read these, these studies. They just tell you, this is how much normal rapid eye movement sleep you should have, and this is how much you have. And it's my patients that I was sending, if you take the group that are all young, healthy females with daily headache, they had either no REM sleep or a half an hour when they should have two, or they only stop breathing. So they have REM related apnea. So if the apnea interrupts the half an hour, so let's say you're supposed to have two hours of REM sleep, during which time you're doing a whole bunch of stuff that you have to do to feel like a normal person, like make memories, make serotonin, make happy juice to be in a good mood and be able to concentrate during the day and you're not getting into that phase. Let's say you have a half an hour instead of two hours, and that half hour, you stop breathing once every five minutes. So it's interrupted. So we do it in blocks, but that suggests that if you interrupt that, you're gonna get in the way of whatever it is we're doing. So then I start concentrating on that, and it's clear that this group of women have a specific very abnormal finding on their sleep study. Now, here's the problem. They aren't stopping breathing per se. So it's not about tonsils, throat, tongue, neck, all the things we were taught. And oh, by the way, how do we get into REM sleep anyway? And I'm not a sleep expert at the time. I become one because I kind of have to, but yeah. what, 
that's not being run by the pulmonologist. The pulmonologists are making these machines that blow air up your nose, but this is run from the brain. That means this is a neurology problem. So where is REM sleep run? Well, it's run in this base part of the brain, just when the, the big lumpy stuff ends, there's this thing that's kind of long and it becomes the spinal cord. It's called the brain stem. That area is the same in the dinosaurs as it is in humans. Exactly the same. It's wow. very basic. That is where all of sleep is controlled. And oh, by the way, the sleep switches, the stripe of the neurons that run our ability to flip into sleep and out of sleep and transition through these phases. None of that is voluntary. When you have insomnia, we act like, well, Karen, you must be screwing up in some way because normal people just sleep. We act like it's your fault, yeah. but it, it can never be your fault because sleep is what runs us. You cannot do it voluntarily. You cannot do it really involuntarily. You just go through your life and then you lie down when you think you're supposed to fall asleep and then you either do or don't. All of insomnia at the time, no one is addressing, they're still not addressing it. So if you look at sleep apnea as a problem, there are way more people who have insomnia than sleep apnea. If you look at the place where all of this is controlled, there is an automatic center that breathes for you while you're unconscious. And oh, by the way, the other thing that my pulmonologist told me was, I said, well, why would they get apneic only in REM? Why would they stop breathing only in REM and not the rest of the time? We're thinking this is a big, you know, big, huge fat tongue because they're fat. Yeah. They said, no, no, we, we get the most paralyzed of all in REM sleep. I was like, what? You get paralyzed? That's, that's really creepy. <laughs> what, you mean we get like paralyzed? Paralyzed? Yeah. We get, not only do we get paralyzed, but in REM sleep, we paralyze this. Every single moving part must get paralyzed, i.e. not moving, in order to repair. And it turns out we repair this part, tongue, cheeks, teeth, throat, any moving part up here in rapid eye movement sleep, towards the end of sleep, all the place where my women never sleep, like after 3 a.m., forget it. That means that if you don't get paralyzed correctly, you can be chewing, like you can have jaw pain, or you can be too paralyzed. And when you get too paralyzed, your tongue falls back and it includes your opening. So he says, oh yeah, well that's, and then I went, well, wait a minute. If this is happening, this is one of those brainstem run things. These are the neurons that run our paralysis. What do we know about that? It turns out we know a lot about it. Back in 2000, there's a guy writing a neurobiology textbook that says these cells right here, the nucleus reticularis, pontus oralis caudalis, uh, if these got a little too paralyzed, they could make you have apnea. And if they weren't paralyzed enough, they could make you have acting out of dreams or moving your legs. All the things that we record on these sleep studies, periodic limb movements of sleep, kicking, things that make women have knee pain and hip pain and ankle pain when they wake up, as well as problems with their sleep. If you are not getting paralyzed perfectly, then you are not actually benefiting from the sleep that you do have. With that additional knowledge, I'm now looking at the brainstem. I'm reading all these articles about how do we get paralyzed? Why would the paralysis be screwed up? Why would this be an epidemic? Why do I have so many patients with daily headache who have knee pain that are only 30 mm -hmm. and they're young and healthy and fit? And why are their kids not sleeping? And this didn't happen when I was 30. This is an epidemic. So because I'm living in the same world that you are, I'm still in this toxins, uh, you know, roundup, life is safe, bad food, uh, you know, not eating right, not doing things right. And then one of my patients has a sleep study. She's 18. She has a sleep study. I'm, I'm sending all of my patients for sleep studies now. If they don't have wow. apnea, I'm giving them sleeping pills. I'm looking at it in a really different way. Because if just sleeping into deep sleep with a CPAP mask can make somebody better, then it has to mean that sleep is the way we cure all illness, really. 
what if I don't want to have, what if I don't want to go to the doctor? What if I don't want to be sick in the first place? What, what would that be like? Like I'm, I'm used to thinking that a normal 42 year old is on four medicines. And I start realizing yeah. that. And I think, wait, I'm, I'm 55. I'm not a, well, I am on some medicines, but I don't really want to be on them. Mm-hmm. Uh, what if I could sleep well? What, what if the real question was, if I could perfect my sleep, I would never be sick and I would never come to the doctor. Because you know what? Humans came before doctors. Dinosaurs came before doctors. All of this stuff, even if it's about supplement and natural healing, we are self-assembling. Like, that's a really weird idea. Like, we, we learn about eggs and sperm and everything, but we come together and then we grow. I mean, doctors don't make kids developmentally. This is something that happens inside this miraculous organism. That means sleep is where all of that happens. And yet I don't know anything about it. No. Nothing about medicine is directed at, oh, the first medical problem comes when you don't sleep right. You should be starting there. No, we don't know anything about it. There are lots of reasons for that, but I'm struggling with a lack of information. It's not like I'm looking for something new because I'm have a unique mind. It's that I'm desperate. I have this idea planted in my head that, oh, so many of my patients with stroke and epilepsy and on and on and on, what they really have is a sleep disorder in the background. How come nobody's talking about this? And CPAP devices are just not the answer for people who don't stop breathing. They just don't get into these phases. That puts it more into uh, an on off switch. Okay. So what we were talking about with the migraine, this on off, these cells that are doing these phases are firing at a certain rate. Like when we think about, I'm going to turn the lights on and off in my room, I go to the switch, I turn it on. And then these little electrons flow in the water to the light inside our body. What's really happening when I want to keep myself, let's say I want to keep my arm right here. I'm fly, firing the up signal at a certain rate and the down signal at a certain rate, and I'm keeping it right in the middle. So our neurons that are running our sleep are actually firing at a certain rate. And if the rate gets a little bit off and they go a little tiny bit too fast, you get a little too paralyzed. If I'm a little too slow, you're not paralyzed enough. And I'm thinking about this, but it's not too helpful. I mean, you know, I babble on to my patients about it and they're probably bored to death. But it turns out I pull these articles that have a guy with a little tiny wire in this cell, in a rat, in this sleep pacemaker cell, and he's dropping these chemicals on it. He drops serotonin on it, and it goes a little faster. He drops norepinephrine, it goes a little slower. He drops acetylcholine, drops GABA on it. He's dropping these chemicals that you and I read about in a bigger way, and he's watching the firing rate moving around. And I'm like, this guy is doing experiments on what is going on with my patients. But why would something that was so incredibly perfectly designed, like dinosaurs got perfectly paralyzed while they were sleeping. That's like, that's oh, so overwhelming. Yeah. This has been tried in millions of versions and it's perfect. But in the last 40 years, it has failed around the globe in humans only. If you count insomnia, it's like 80% of the population. That is very fast and very global. Then what happens is an 18 year old walks in, she's got a sleep study that's got 18, she's got 10 solid hours of sleep. She sleeps fine, as far as she's concerned. She has no deep sleep. She has none of the sleep that makes for healing repair of her body or her brain. She has none. She wakes to light sleep. So there's light sleep where we roll over. We're a little bit aware, but we're not really awake. She wakes to light sleep 35 times an hour, never gets into deep sleep. And she is coming to see me because she has daily headache. Her headache got better with what I gave her, but she's really tired. And I'm looking at this sleep study going, I bet you're tired. Yeah. This is a disaster. I don't have a clue. And what on earth could be wrong with her? She turned out to have a B12 deficiency that was extremely profound. It was like 170, enough that it was actually on the lab slip said low. 
but I have no experience with any vitamins. But because I was so desperate, and for the first time I'm thinking, oh, those little cells, they're trying to do this thing that they have to do every day. They make these, they're pacemakers, they keep firing. What if they run out faster than all the other cells? I mean, she looks otherwise perfect, but she's not. And for, so for the first time, I'm reading about sleep on a single cell basis and thinking, well, what if she could have a deficiency state? That would be so cool. We could give her back something these little cells need. And then they start to do their job right again and she could do everything right. So I would never picture insomnia as a deficiency state, except that you go to Google and it's like, you know, what are the signs of B12 deficiency? It says fatigue and daily headache. I was like, I've been doing a headache for 20 years. I've never done a B12 level in a headache patient in my life. It doesn't say that in the neurology textbooks about headache. It says it under B12 deficiency, okay? So for the first time, I started doing B12 levels. The B12 levels are about maybe one in four have a lowish B12. But soon after that, another one of my clients mentions that her D was low and she, her doctor gave her D and her wrist pain went away. I had mentioned to you that these women have pain that they shouldn't have. When you're 32, your knees shouldn't hurt, your hips shouldn't hurt. Your wrist shouldn't hurt from lifting your kid. You know, I mean, you're 30 years old. Yeah. So I threw in a vitamin D level because I was doing a B12 level anyway, not because I knew anything. And I wasn't the least bit interested either, but I just, you know, why not? I'm drawing blood anyway. And within about four months, and it happens, I was doing this between August and, and uh, December. So right at the time when, even if you know nothing about D, you know, it comes from the sun and that's when the D should be the highest. And every single person who's had a sleep study, everybody who I am treating for their daily headache and a few others are getting these labs done with me. And I'm, I'm looking at their D levels. Every single one of them, the D is low. And I think, well, who cares? And I write, take a thousand IUs of vitamin D. Um, and then in December, two guys come back and say, and they're all both on CPAP, both have daily headache, but both had D levels that were a little better than most of the women. And they both come back and say, you know, you sent me that note about the vitamin D and I've been wearing my CPAP, by the way. I wear it every night. You told me it would take my headaches away, but it didn't. But once you sent me that little note about the vitamin D, I started taking it. And within about three weeks, my sleep was better and my headache went away. Two guys told me that in one week. And at the time, I would have said, that's ridiculous. But the B12 isn't panning out. And, I'm, and I've been doing this for five years. And I, I don't have anything to offer. I know that sleep is the key. But the sleeping pills are never really what you want. So that leads me to a PubMed search about vitamin D and sleep. And at the time, that was 2009, there was not a single hit. But if the next thing you put into the search engine is vitamin D in the brain, it turns out there's a guy who already has established that there are vitamin D receptors in this nucleus pontus oralis caudalis. This nucleus where we get paralyzed, there are the little vitamin D receptors in there. Oh, oh my like, gosh. This is bizarre. Like, yeah. This is the bone vitamin and it's all over this place where we get paralyzed for sleep. Why would this guy even be writing? It turns out he's got 30 years of articles about all the different places in the brain, including the pituitary, by the way, that runs all of our hormones. So the D is designed to change your hormones so that you don't have babies when there is no food because then the species survives. That means D runs most of the hormonal systems in our body so that you can have your babies when there's D, i.e. sun, i.e. food. So he's already written about D and infertility. He's already written about D and postpartum depression. He's already written about D and seasonal affective disorder. He has 30 years of putting together a framework so that you can understand this never was a vitamin. That was a big mistake. Yeah, it was yeah. always a hormone and it's the boss that allows us to have a fertile summer hormone state where we work, we till the soil, we're outside, we're doing things and a winter state where we hibernate and we conserve energy and we get fat. Mm -hmm. So in the background, your topic is really about weight 
And this is the core of how we put on weight after our babies and why the weight is refractory. You get to a certain place, you've done this twice already with the last two kids, you do the same thing, nothing happens. And it turns out that it's not D directly, it's D through the microbiome. So now, lucky for me, the whole GI literature has made it clear that get weight gain, obesity is an endocrine problem that actually is using chemicals that are produced by the microbiome. But the reason behind it is D changes the microbiome or the bacterial makeup in your belly, and it changes it to a winter population so that when you take in calories, you put it in fat. You don't have a choice in it. It's not that you're eating wrong. Like we don't follow the bears around and go, that fat bear, he's a big fat slob. He's, you know, nobody's going to want to mate with him. He needs and, weight loss surgery. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't do that. We go, oh, that bear is going to make it through the winter. Yeah. Is he actually deciding what he's going to eat? Well, it turns out he's not deciding what he's going to eat. He gets hungry. That is an involuntary state as well. That level of hunger is actually run by certain short chain fatty acids that the bacteria secrete, they go up into our nose and they make Krispy Kremes smell better. They actually mean that after a full meal, you can still be hungry. That's an endocrine problem. That is not you being a, a big fat slob. That is important because this is seen frequently in the same poor person who's been trying to lose weight who's been trying to control her headaches, who's also depressed, who has two kids, and is at the end of her rope, and it does have a central mechanism. So up until last year, it was my theory based on the guy I was telling you about that has all these articles. His name is Walter Stump. He should have gotten the Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. His colleagues in the vitamin D field thought he was arrogant and they didn't like him. Therefore, this viewpoint of D was not taught in endocrinology. Endocrinology has still not embraced D the way they should. It's bizarre, but humans are humans. So he's been writing about it for 30 years, but nobody knows about it. Taking that information, he has vitamin D affects all parts of the GI tract. It wasn't until last year that we actually had clinical trials that showed that vitamin D is a growth producing factor for our normal microbiome. If you do not have a D that's over 40, likely you have a winter or a bad microbiome, and you will then have an increased risk of getting fat, having IBS, having a million other autoimmune diseases and bad things happen to you. And that the D is directly one of the determinants of whether or not you will have a healthy microbiome. So one of the things that happened to me was I got into all of Walter's articles. So I tell you about these two guys that come in, the D is a player in sleep. The B12 is a secondary player. B12 already has a bunch of articles about B12 playing a role in sleep. So it's already well established as being part of how we sleep normally. D does not have that. But what I started with Walter's help was to try vitamin D in all my patients who don't sleep and I have sleep studies in them. And all I really did was say, okay, let's take some vitamin D and see what your vitamin D level is. There is not a single dose for everyone. That's the vitamin mistake. It is a blood level that you establish. And what I did was to say, okay, if everybody's got Ds that are low, let's just keep asking them, are you sleeping better? What do you feel? What do you think? Any better? No. Okay, what's your D level? 40, okay, well, if, it could, if it's 30 to 100 for the normal range, it can't be that bad to be like right in the middle. Why don't we go a little higher? Okay, so for a whole year and a half, I'm just giving out vitamin D and saying, okay, let's try this and see what happens. And people start to come back and say, you know what? I'm sleeping better. I'm like, wow, really? What's your D level? I don't know. Oh, well, let's send you down. I, didn't, I wasn't even smart enough to send them before they came to the office, okay? I'm not doing a clinical trial. I'm just yeah. desperate. They're desperate. We don't know what to do. And everybody's D is low. So I'm taking vitamin D. Now everybody's taking vitamin D. And 60 to 80 blood level is where sleep is best. And you can screw up your sleep just as terribly with a D above 80 as you can below 60. And Again, keeping in mind that what you're trying to do here is get to a D blood level 
that improves the sleep in someone with a sleep disorder, okay? That's a different thing than saying, I've never been sick in my life. I want to have the best performance that my body can have, okay? It's my suspicion that we have to actually go into 60 and 80 as the blood level to make up for a huge deficiency state that's throughout all the tissues, okay? So there's like a Swiss cheese of holes. Once, now 10 years have gone by and vitamin D is functional in almost every organ in the body in really important ways. That means when we take it, it gets sucked into every cell in the body. And what we're measuring in your blood, which you must do to use this chemical safely, is we're measuring the leftovers we're measuring the stuff that's not in the cell or in the brain. That's kind of a different concept, okay? So now in the background, my headache patients are sleeping better and their headaches go away. And it's just like, oh, wow, this is amazing. Now, here's the depressing part. Oh. <laughs> yeah, we think, oh, little pill, golden ball, really cheap, easy, blood levels are a bit of a hassle. I'm just going to take this. My headaches are going to go away. My sleep's going to get better and everything will be great. But it's not like that. Every single time you mess with a single hormone, this will resonate with you. You mess with one hormone, you just you change all of them. 25 other ones, okay? So, and D is the boss of multiple hormonal systems. So there's a reason why this same population of young, healthy females often has gallbladder disease or thyroid disease. Yes. Because vitamin D is the emulsifier. It dissolves the bile acids. So cholesterol and vitamin D dissolve the bile acids. So young, healthy females are the ones that get gallstones because their D is low and they get thyroid problems because the way animals hibernate and we hibernate is we sleep more and we bring the energy metabolism down in all the cells. How do we do that? With the thyroid, right. of course. That means D runs the thyroid. The thyroid goes low when the D goes low. That's how you sleep in your little bare you know, a hole with your cubs underneath the snow. We don't think of that, even though endocrinology should be seeing that. They, you know, it's still very upsetting to me that they won't take responsibility for this hormone. That means that not only is just hypothyroidism that shows up after your second kid that mysteriously goes away three years later. I mean, I see that all the time in my patients. Yeah. Then there are other things like, oh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. That's an autoimmune disease. Most of the autoimmune diseases are linked to these two things. D is all about the immune system. Now, yeah. even lay people know that. Yeah. D also then affects the microbiome. When your microbiome is bad, it turns out there's this whole cascade of events that means that your likelihood for autoimmune disease goes way up. So getting back to what happened, we're all taking D, we get a D 60 to 80, we're starting to sleep better. And at the end of two years of that, we all start to fail. I want to make sure we get this part in the interview because okay. we picture, oh, just give some estrogen, you'll be fine. And then you do that for a while and then you go, oh, I guess we need to do this. And it's no matter what you put in there, humans are really very short-sighted in that they think we can just fix this little thing and then everything will be okay. I still think that way. I, I can't help it because we do better when we isolate a single variable. But in actual fact, we've affected a bunch of other things every time we tinker with stuff. And we're biohacking with this D. At the end of two years, most of us stopped sleeping or went back to whatever it is we had before. And we started to have more pain. And the pain was of many different kinds. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but there were also three other things that didn't get better. They didn't lose weight. Remember how I said I was pretty sure that obesity was linked. And I kept thinking, you know, I got this gal who's 100 pounds overweight and she is walking every day at lunchtime and it's 100 degrees outside. It was 100 degrees every day during the time she was walking. That means her autonomic nervous system to control her inside temperature is much better because most people here in Texas can't tolerate 100 degrees. She's just walking at noon. And I'm like, I, I can't even believe she can do that. But she doesn't lose weight. That's really weird. Then the second thing that happened is the IBS didn't go away. So even though there was this link to the GI tract and I was theorizing D should be a trophic factor for the bacteria, it didn't fix them. The bugs did not get better. And then the third thing was, 
by the end of the two years, everybody stops sleeping again. So D by itself is clearly not the whole story. Okay? Mm. And at, at this point, I'm desperate again. And I have this peculiar buttock pain where I can't sit down at the end of the day. It has nothing to do with injury. I didn't hurt myself. And I'm like, this is bizarre. And I'm not going to go to my doctor and ask for an MRI on my butt. <laughs> and I've already gotten into this mindset, which is, if you have a pain that's present when you wake up in the morning, that's unexplained, or you didn't injure yourself, then you're doing something weird with your body during that phase when you're supposed to be paralyzed. And in right. this case, it's probably my hamstrings. My hamstrings are inserting into this ischial tuberosity I'm sitting on. Well, why is that happening? You know, and so a gal walks into a door with a book about B5, which is pantothenic acid, which is a B vitamin. I have no training in vitamins because I'm a regular MD, no interest in them. Everybody, I always say, no, it's not a vitamin, it's really a hormone, so it's okay. That means I'm not a vitamin whack job. <laughs> and she walks in the door with this book and it turns out pantothenic acid is one of the most important overlooked things that there is, okay? This is a much longer lecture, but in summary, it turns out that our bugs that are supposed to be there in our belly, that just come spontaneously, Okay, you don't have to supply probiotics. You know, every other animal on this planet uses the microbiome that they were given that just comes in. Remember, all the other animals live outdoors. So what happened four years ago that coincides is sunscreen, air conditioning, computers, and moving inside. Even my rural patients have fully air conditioned tractors. They do not expose themselves to the sun and they put sunscreen on because we're told to do that. So the coincidence is the timing starting in the 80s when chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, irritable bowel, autism all start to go dramatically up. So the second piece of this is D does run the microbiome, but the second piece that you have to know is the B vitamins. And the odd part about this is why would there be eight vitamins called B? Like, what's that up? You know, A? Then there's eight things called B, and then there's C and D and E. <laughs> Why would you name eight things B? You know, I, it took me probably until last year to think of that. I, that's ridiculous, but I've been talking about B vitamins forever. There are eight chemicals that our bugs, our normal healthy bugs make, and they're made in a very specific ratio to one another. And they're made by the bacteria because they're feeding them to each other. They're really not for us. Those bugs have been on this planet for billions of years before the dinosaurs came and they made riboflavin. They make thiamine, they make niacin. They are the ones that have made these chemicals. And actually, if you go into the history of the vitamin discoveries, these were all chemicals that were bacterial growth factors reported in the 19, 20, 1930 in little Petri dishes. So wow. they would take <clears throat> the stuff and we actually grew this in a yeast mixture that you would use to make beer or bread. When you make bread, you put the yeast in there. Yeast makes D2, not the same thing we make, but yeast makes D, and you set it on the counter, and it has to be open. And the reason why it has to be open, and you have to have it at a certain temperature, is you're letting the bacteria grow at a certain temperature, coming from the air and the water. And what you actually have at the end of the day is a mixture of bacteria and yeast and you use it to make bread. But what's in there is a bunch of species that make eight B vitamins. And they pour that into a Petri dish and started to look at the bacteria when they started microbiology, the very first steps of microbiology. And then they began to realize, well, that guy got that little white one with the red tops on it to grow. What did he do? I want that one. I'm gonna name myself after that. It looks like really dramatic, you know? It turns out they find these little chemicals that are in this yeast bacteria mixture and they realize they are growth factors. And then within the next 10 to 20 years, we say, oh, I wonder if humans could need growth factors too. Well, yes. And they are the growth factors that these bacteria have been producing for us. So in summary, the B vitamins really don't come from the food. They really come in a very specific ratio from the production minute to minute for 24 hours a day from our normal microbiome. That means when you lose your D level and your microbiome deserts you, 
They cannot come back with just D. They are a symbiotic foursome that needs all the other bees. They produce their own bee soup. So if you, however, pay attention to that and you know about it, you take D and you take B50, which turns out to have all eight Bs, 50 milligrams of each, you recreate this B vitamin soup. And by the end of three months, your belly bacteria are completely back to normal. And that is very consistent. So the reason why I have a website and a workbook is to protect people from taking D without doing this second step. Because if you take D by itself, what happens to you is your microbiome does not grow back. You need more and more bees because you really do start to sleep better for a while. You start to feel better, but then you use up all your bee stores. So the idea that we don't have stores of bees is a lie. There's plenty of scientific literature to show that that's the case. And more importantly, my butt was hurting. Most of my patients had pain. It turns out that B5 and acetylcholine are in the background behind inflammatory pain. So if you take D without bringing back your microbiome, which is the supplier of your additional support, your bees, you are putting yourself at risk for more inflammation throughout your body. It's not what you intended. You intended to feel healthier with the D, but two or three years after starting it, and that's the creepy part, it sneaks up on you later. So you really do have to take D, do your blood levels, get your microbiome back, and then once you put all those pieces back in place, you're now operating on this planet with all the organs of your body you were meant to have. Because you really, when you have a low D for several years, you really lose an organ of your body. It does many, many important things for us. Wow. Okay. Whew. First off, little fact for you. I just interviewed a woman that wrote a phenomenal book about beating breast cancer. And she told me there is no known cases of women with breast cancer with a vitamin D level over 60. Oh, so there you go, ladies. Not just like, that's just like, it seems like it's the same number. It's always, we have to be breast over cancer 60. and prostate cancer both are the two cancers that are clearly linked. Yeah, that's just, that's amazing. Now, what about vitamin D? Also, we know that we also have to take it with K's. Now, do you find that as well in your practice or does that more have to do with the bone rather it's than- really about bone. So yeah. I would say, okay, so everybody who's talking about D is focusing unfortunately still on this bone vitamin, okay? You're one of the few people who's already deeply into hormones. So you, have a, you already have a really good sense for, even if I don't know about orexin or I don't know much about melatonin, if I know about estrogen and progesterone, and I know that these other two chemicals are hormones, there are certain behaviors that I'm going to start looking for. For instance, you have this really good interview about if you take progesterone, it can potentially be changed into testosterone. That is the way hormones work. They actually are self-adjusting. They can be converted back and forth. Okay. Now, Having said that, most of the literature on the internet and most of the scientific literature is concentrating on bone vitamin, and they say K is a cofactor for D for building bones. Well, in fact, that's not exactly true. K2 has a different life and purpose than K1. K2 is about directing calcium. So the calcium is brought in, encouraged to be absorbed by D, so D makes you get more calcium from your food. That means you have more calcium in your body and you can put it in your bones. If you don't have enough D, then where is your body supposed to get the calcium to run all the things that it uses calcium for? Like putting your cells on and off because those are little positive charges and we use them to turn all the brain on and off. You suck it out of your bone, that's where you get it. So the storage place is in the bone. K is needed to put direct the calcium into the bone. That means if you have osteoporosis, if you have osteopenia, or if you found to have calcium hanging out in places where it's not supposed to be, like in your cardiac vessels or in some tendon somewhere, then you should take K with D. But it turns out that the microbiome is the natural source for K2. That means if you get your microbiome back, like all the other animals out there, they're not going into GNC and getting K2 with their D. They're just outdoors. 
And there is a natural amount that's provided by the microbiome. So depends a bit on what your detail is in the background. So I, the reason why I don't push K is I've already got people on a multivitamin, B50, D, and B12 if they're B12 deficient. So that's a whole, you know, it's a pile of vitamins. So I don't want to, I don't really like the idea of taking supplements. I, I like the idea of it's going to make me sleep better, but I don't really want to keep taking them if I could get my body to go back to the natural state. And the natural state was we didn't take supplements because we didn't know about them. Yeah. So can we do it through fixing our microbiome through food and making sure we get enough sunlight? That's an excellent question. Okay, so I've had occasional clients who use nutritional yeast and naturopaths who prefer to use a large dose of nutritional yeast, which actually most of the suppliers, it appears to me, are putting bees in that yeast. Because when you just cook some yeast out there and then dry it, make it into a powder, you really don't have guarantees and they, and they really want you to put the doses in there, okay? So it looks to me like you could potentially use nutritional yeast as a source. Also, interestingly, in those same articles from the 1920s, that same liquid that they were using for beer and bread is also called the antipolyneuritic factor. That means it was used for burning in the feet which is something that's now more and more common. And it actually is supplying the B5 the, and all eight Bs that you need to treat this neuropathy, okay? So that means you could conceivably use a natural source, but you need a pretty big source of all of them, okay? Because I was already taking a multivitamin in some of my clients and that do dose of Bs was not enough because the rest of the body is B deficient and it's sucking that stuff up. You, in order to reconstitute your bugs, you have to have big enough doses in this bee soup in your belly that they're going, oh yeah, this is what I need. And they're all growing back, okay? So you kind of have to share it with your bugs. So as far as I can tell, I have not seen someone convert their body back to having a normal microbiome just through taking D and having a normal diet or whatever diet it is. The reason why I got into this, I was gonna be flipping houses when I retired. I wasn't planning to do this. So. The reason why I got into it was, I think D by itself is a dangerous chemical, that there's so much misinformation. And I, I induced in myself and in other patients, this pain syndrome that could be prevented and treated by bringing the microbiome back and learning about that, I think is so important. And now that COVID has come and everybody knows about D and everybody started taking D, this piece is really, really important. It's not just the part that I'm talking about. B5 is something that I talk about a lot on my website because no one else talks about it because the current dogma is there is no pantothenic acid deficiency because it's in every food. That is a lie. That turns out to be completely a lie, made up. Um, the burning that we see on television programs to, to advertise pharmaceuticals, that is actually a B5 deficiency state. And it's getting to be more and more common. Also, B5 is one of the cofactors that becomes coenzyme A that makes acetylcholine. So to give you a bigger picture, what's deficient in most people that causes the problem is a chemical called acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter. That neurotransmitter is responsible for keeping us focused during the day. Oh, could that go low? I mean, my kid can't stay focused. Yeah, there's the whole body of literature about kids with ADD are really acetylcholine deficient. Why are we giving them amphetamines, which really increase norepinephrine and epinephrine when really they're deficient in acetylcholine? And when the author comes to the, the final discussion, they say things like, well, really the only drug we have that mimics acetylcholine is nicotine. And you read that and go, oh yeah, like I'm gonna get my moms to give their kid a cigarette at recess. It's not gonna happen, you know? No. But you know what's weird? There are already clinical trials using nicotine patches in autistic kids and in kids with ADD because now the chemistry has moved to the place that it's clear that our inability to focus is an acetylcholine deficiency. Now, what's weird about that is acetylcholine is used to keep us focused and organized during the day. And then you flip a switch, if you have a normal sleep switch, 
and you use acetylcholine, the same exact chemical, to flip into these various phases of sleep and get paralyzed normally. So if you don't have the right acetylcholine level, you can't get paralyzed correctly. So that and B5 and D both coming together to make acetylcholine is the biochemical background for all these things that I was watching in my patients, daily headache, inability to sleep. But if you look a little further, you'll find that acetylcholine deficiency is also documented in Parkinson's disease and in Alzheimer's disease and in autistic kids. So if you step back a minute, you can say, oh, could there be one mechanism that has happened in an epidemic that may lead to populations that are globally acetylcholine deficient, but present in many different ways. They have different diseases that are all linked to these things. This opens a whole a different way of thinking about why would I be interested in vitamins, okay? Th these are powerful chemicals. They are part of our biochemistry. They should never have been treated as though, oh, real doctors aren't interested in vitamins. This is a big mistake that happened concomitantly in the 1980s, okay? So at the same time as I'm finishing medical school, and I did get educated about vitamins because it was before that, but promptly forgot all about it. But that means that this idea that vitamins are somehow different than every other chemical is bizarre. If you look into the chemistry of how do we make all the neurotransmitters that allows you and me to be happy, to be able to think correctly, to not have a migraine and to sleep normally, Every single one of those chemicals uses a B vitamin as a cofactor to be made. So if you lose your microbiome, you lose eight B vitamins that used to be supporting your intelligence, your ability to be strong and thoughtful and stay concentrated on what you want to do and then fall asleep at night and stay asleep for eight hours. Can we take, like, when you say acetylcholine, can we take that as a supplement? Like, I know there's Good phosphatidylcholine. Awesome. <laughs> I take phosphatidylcholine. <laughs> yes. It turns out that acetylcholine can't be taken as a, as a chemical, but that's a really good question. In fact, the only, and interestingly, once I tell you all these drugs, I mean, all these diseases, we're like, well, how come my kid isn't on an acetylcholine drug? And here's what happened to me. I'm reading this stuff online because I'm just given these vitamins and I don't understand what's happening. With them. They're having dramatic effects, but I'm like, holy crap, this is acting like a drug. Like this, when I get it right, they sleep. When you don't get it right, you get it too high a dose, they can't sleep. That's creepy. That's like you take the pill, it goes up into your head, it makes you an insomniac. That was just sitting on the shelf at the, at the, at the nutrition store. Like, wait a minute, our way of thinking about these chemicals is wrong. They can go right in your brain and change things. Now, having said that, you would think, since I'm a neurologist, I mean, I can't even, normal people don't know what acetylcholine is. I hardly do, okay? And yet I'm a neurologist. So when I read on Google that acetylcholine, so I pull up and search, what does acetylcholine do in the brain? Because the weird thing is, I'm thinking, Acetylcholine is at the neuromuscular junction. It makes us move, you know, myasthenia. You know, I have a little list of things that I should come up with when they say acetylcholine is made in the brain. But even as a neurologist, I, it's hard. I, like, like Alzheimer's disease is a deficiency, but what does acetylcholine really do? Like, I can't really think of what it does. It turns out that even neurologists learn these neurotransmitters by using the drugs I know what serotonin does because I give a serotonin booster to make the depression better. I know I give dopamine in someone with Parkinson's disease. I know I give GABA type stuff to do this, but it turns out we're using these drugs and then watching our patients have things happen to them. There are no drugs for acetylcholine except nicotine. Except nicotine. Jesus. That's the only one. Now, start we, have, again. we have vilified <laughs> nicotine, okay? Yeah. Now, the weird part is, We've also known that Parkinson's patients who smoke have always done better. Now we have a whole literature that shows that Parkinson's disease is really an acetylcholine deficiency first for the first 10 or 20 years, then they get a dopamine deficiency. So there's this big hole in neurology where the basic science in animals and in cellular science has shown 
And we have all these diseases that are linked to acetylcholine deficiency, but no one has ever broached the possibility that a bug, like a lowly bacteria, is your only source for this neurotransmitter that runs your intelligence. That's basically what you're coming down to. If you have the right bugs, you're really going to be smart and you're going to sleep normally and have a wonderful life. If you have the wrong bugs, you're going to be a mess. And lucky for me, I'm not a GI doctor. So the GI literature has been filling in to show that there's a direct link between the brain and the belly. The vagus mm. nerve goes directly. It's a two-way discussion. That means my ideas that were based in really weird thought in 2016 where I'm having a really hard time really figuring out how I'm going to present this. If you lose your bugs, you're going to get ADD. I mean, nobody's going to believe me about that. No, that's not so far-fetched now. There's a lot of yeah. supportive literature about D talking to the inside lining of the GI tract and all this immune stuff. So there is a background here. Now, do I want our kids to be taking nicotine? No. What we want is for them to have a normal belly and a normal D level and understand that those two chemicals, it turns out that D makes an enzyme that uses the coenzyme A. So it's not just, it's an equation. D mm -hmm. plus B5 equals the amount of acetylcholine that we need. So it's complex and much like your hormonal systems that you're used to working with, they are all intertwined. That means there was a normal D level that we all got because we lived outside. And there was a normal amount of bacteria that was different starting at the mouth and is different when it leaves our body. And that that was a normal supply of all sorts of chemicals that we don't even know about yet. Also, the endocannabinoid system that you're using to sleep the endocannabinoid system is a very important part of the development and the maintenance of the nervous system. The nervous system does not act right if it doesn't have the right cannabinoid. We found that out because we took the plant that has an identical chemical or a similar chemical and got good effects. But that always implies that my own internal supply of the cannabinoids is not right. And it turns out that the building block that becomes the endocannabinoids in your brain comes from the bacteria. So it's not just the B vitamins. Wow. The building blocks to allow my child to go through developmental stages of neural development are coming from the bacteria that he or she doesn't have because mom's D is in the toilet. So preventing this is infinitely easier than going back and treating it. But things like ADD and, and autism are absolutely treatable by providing the, the raw materials and the cure is the sleep. It's never just giving vitamins. It's always when the sleep is better, the brain knows what to do to make the development happen again. It's the same thing for making the headaches better. The vitamins don't fix the headaches. The better sleep fixes the headaches. That means if, you're, if you care and are using the THC to sleep, and we give you right sleep program with it, you are much more likely to be successful this, with this program than you would without the THC because it's playing a very important role. You already found that out because it helps you sleep. <laughs> okay, questions. When someone takes the prescription medications like Ambien, I have heard that they, you don't get REM sleep or you don't go into that. Is that true? Do you I, get paralyzed? Uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, one of the frustrating parts is I knew that none of these sleeping pills really duplicate normal sleep. Okay. And that's really because there are 25 neurotransmitters that all have to be there doing their thing. It's really more like a symphony, okay? But on the other hand, if we have nothing to help you sleep and you get better sleep with whatever it is that you use, then no sleep. What I found out was if I can find the right sleeping pill for this person at this moment, and it changes over time, that's the depressing part, is you take it and you sleep for two years if you're lucky, and then it starts to wear off. The brain says, yeah, I needed that. But now what are these other things? If you picture it instead as, there are 25 cooperative chemicals that are supposed to be performing like a symphony. 
and I've added one violinist and all the rest of them are just, you know, there's a broken drum and this guy doesn't have a mouthpiece and whatever, you're gonna have a little bit of a move in the positive direction. In my view, all of the sleeping pills are found by accident, really. I mean, the erection stuff and the melatonin stuff is taken from what we know of the biology, but most of it, we stumble on it by accident, and then we start using it. In fact, the reason why it works is because humans come back and say, hey, I, I slept better. We don't really know what the mechanism is. That means if you sleep better with whatever the sleeping pill is that you've got, it's better than nothing. Mm -hmm. If you wanna fix what's wrong in the background, that's what you're gonna to have to do to get a long lasting permanent improvement. But I am personally not against the sleeping medicines because in my experience, the, the healing, the actual fixing of things, including the sleep switches, is something the brain does. It, it, it's not the vitamins that do it. The vitamins are the building blocks. And then the neurons take in the vitamins and go, oh, we have to do this with it, okay? We have to secrete this little chemical at this time. It's quite complex. So from my point of view, vilifying the sleeping medicines is kind of like saying, Karen, you do it wrong. You know, it's your own fault. It's, it's blaming the patient for their own problem. If we as physicians and scientists had a better answer and we could fix you, then you would say, okay, fine, I, I don't mind. I don't, I don't want to take Ambien, you know, just fix me and I'll be fine, okay? So I think, the, I think the sleeping medicines still play a big role in a lot of people. We all want to get off of them. And I think you will never get off of them if you don't fix what the deficiency state is in the background. But in coordination with doing that, I think they can play an important role. Yeah, I, I agree. I always said it's better to take that than not sleep. Like not Absolutely. sleeping is much more of a health problem than taking Ambien is. And that's what I told myself forever. But Good. it's interesting too, because when you when you talk about the sleep switches, when it happened to me post-pregnancy, it was about a year and a half after my daughter. And you talk about this on your blog, which is, of course, pregnancy just rips us of our vitamins, <laughs> right? Yep. yep. And it was, I always said, I, I felt like a switch went on and I couldn't turn it off. And it just made, it was like, no matter what I did, there was no, I could not fall asleep. It didn't matter how tired I was. I would just lie there. And it was like the switch wouldn't turn off. And now yeah. I understand listening to you speak about what was happening with those neurotransmitters, not working properly and not, yeah. you know, there's something, but no, yeah, that's just so fascinating. It's so it's like a big, perfect storm that we've had happen, which is, a, our microbiome is getting worse and worse with antibiotics and the food we're eating. We're not getting sun. Kids from the time that they're out of the womb are being slathered in sunscreen from their entire life. I see these kids at the park. They've got their hats on, their swim shirts on. Their faces are pure white with sunblock. The mothers are spraying these chemicals yeah. all over their child. And I'm like, oh gosh, what are you doing to your kid? This it's kid's not getting any taught. vitamin D. I want to be, I want to be a good mom, you know, how can you be a good mom if, you know, put sunscreen on it? And this is a difficult thing because that means, well, how am I supposed to answer all those dermatologists that tell me I'm doing something bad for my kid? But in actual fact, here's what happened. The dermatologists are standing there in the 1980s saying sun exposure causes basal cell carcinoma on this 75 year old guy on his ear. Okay. That's really what they're talking about. And they're saying, look, we should put on this sunscreen. So we make these chemicals. It's not that those are bad chemicals. It's that these should be used intelligently. But over time, what we've done instead is we've traded autism and hyperactivity and terrible depression and all sorts of other things so that we wouldn't have a basal cell on our ear when we were 75. And it's because as the dermatologists are standing there saying, oh, sun exposure is bad, there's no other set of 25 other physicians saying, hey, but I'm a kidney doctor. It protects my kidney. Hey, I'm a brain doctor. It does good things. So the rest of us aren't standing there saying, you know, you're focusing on your organ uh, in, in, a, in a way that's ignoring the effects of this stuff that's made on our skin in a way that really produces a normally functioning brain until you're 90. You so we are really seeing the long-term fallout of taking D away from the population. 
And let me just mention one other thing. Every single one of you that are watching this or listening to this, you have to go back and speak to your physician. Now, the problem is that there is no money to be made from vitamin D. There is no drug company funding for making vitamin D studies that are done in the right way to show us get healthy. There's no profit. All of the vitamin D studies done in the last 10 years and for the last 20 years, the basic scientists have been saying we need prospective or let's start with vitamin D at this year and measure what happens in 10 years to prove that we can cure things and we can prevent things. But instead of treating it like a hormone, which would be, oh, this is a dangerous hormone level, 28, bad. We need to move this person to a healthy hormone level, which would be 45. Whatever you declare it's gonna be, you have to prove that you've included this person in the study and you've kept their D level at 45 for 10 years and you watch whether or not they get breast cancer or not. The studies are not done that way. What they do is to give all the people in the treatment trial 2000 IUs. 2000 IUs, if you don't know what their blood level is, is worthless. You don't know if their blood level went too high in the 10th year because you never checked it. Once you get good with doing hormones, you immediately start to think, well, I have to ask this person if she has this, this, and this, because that means the hormone is too high or too low. You just automatically start to think about clinical questions. Never do they ask how people feel and never do they do a second D level and have a stated accomplished D level that is meant to prevent or treat this disease. They have only done it retrospectively. So that gal telling you about the study with breast cancer mm -hmm. is done doing D levels retrospectively, but none of the prospective studies are thinking about this as a hormone. Therefore, in 2020, there was one study that has now been spread out into eight publications, between five and eight publications, saying that vitamin D at 2000 a day over a five year span in 25,000 people showed absolutely no effect in preventing cardiac disease or cancer or macular disease. And they just keep using the same data over and over to have different outcomes. When you look into the study itself, it turns out only two thirds of the people ever had a single D level. They didn't even do all the D levels in everyone. So they claimed to have 25,000 people that it was a really strong study. Only 836 of those people that were treated with D ever had a second D level, and that was done at one year. That means the thing is published as though we have 25,000 people studied over five years and nothing happens. Yeah. But the data actually inside it has nothing to do with that. So, and then that's magnified. I've just published five articles, and then I do a meta analysis that shows that. All of the outcomes of the prospective studies done with D in 2020, none of them showed any sort of positive result. But there's a reason why. That's really sad. That means the physician that you're going to go to try to talk to about already has sort of been brainwashed. And it's not they're, they're not stupid. They're reading the literature. But the literature is done incorrectly because vitamin means there's a dose. Hormone means there's a blood level. And they need to be checking that. So get your vitamin D3 tested, get your B12. What if your D is in good range and your B12 is over range? Cause that I see B12 being over range quite often actually. And I've heard different things that it, it doesn't mean that you have too much of it. It could actually mean that you're not absorbing it. Have you heard that? It is a very complex question. Okay. So, um, <laughs> In, in a short answer, we've been giving shots of B12 for a long time, okay? Mm -hmm. One, you don't really have to give shots if you just, if you are deficient. And I have arbitrarily said that below 500 in the US is deficient and you should take a thousand micrograms a day. But there are people who actually have some B measurements that are too high. One of the com problems is those B, measurements don't have anything to do with the B stores or the amount that's really being used in the nervous system. 
those blood levels are not accurate as to whether or not we have enough in our body to use it correctly. Okay, so that's number one. You can't dep depend on the blood levels. Number two is if you've lost your microbiome, so you're not getting the supply of all eight, you can have situations where either B12 or even B6 also can be too high, where I've actually, when we do do the right sleep program and we get the microbiome back, we see those levels come back down again. So, and there is other micro, um, there are other articles that are about how the bees come as an eight pack because they're all intertwined biologically in every place they're used in the bacteria and every place they're used in us. So that if you don't have the right complement of those eight, you really can't use that B6. Therefore, it's either not absorbed or not being used. Then the, the, the other question you should always ask when the B12 looks high is, is the person on B12 supplement? Because in a person who's not B12 deficient, if you're taking B12 supplement in your multivitamin and some of the, if you're really into supplements and you go into Whole Foods and you buy their multivitamin, they have huge doses of bees in there. And that can mean that your B12 level is too high. There are a few people who have B12 levels that are high that are not on supplement. Me. I don't really picture that as a difficulty most of the time, but I also don't think I know everything. Yeah. I, I interviewed a DNA expert and she was, she, she was the one that ex tried to explain to me why that can be because you have different genetic issues with absorbing your bees and getting your bees in. And she said, so if you don't have enough of the other B vitamins, it can make it so that your B12 gets too high because you're actually not absorbing it. So just, and I would look, I would level. use that word absorb. I would think of it in a slightly different way. We tend to focus on the belly when we say absorb. Yep. Really, the vitamin is going into your bloodstream, but it's not going into the cell and being used to do the That's what I mean. Yeah. Absorbed yes, in the cell. Exactly. Yeah. That's what you really mean by it. That means yep. that our blood testing of it has got all this extra running around because it doesn't have the other cofactors it needs to be used correctly. And mm -hmm. she's right that there are other genetic things that, that contribute to that. Effective Ultimately, bees. I am not as knowledgeable about the genetic pieces of this. And I really depend on the naturopaths and the functional medicine specialists to know more about it. And I really don't think that I'm an expert in vitamins. I really feel like what I stepped into by accident is that D and the microbiome are both really linked to one another and to having normal sleep. And that once you put those pieces in place, all the other things that all the other people are teaching us about, uh, you know, the Zach Bushes of the world and the um, Stephanie Seneffs of the world that are doing high, high level biochemistry. Those are still valuable pieces of information. But I think if we have the basics in place, we'll have a better outcome by doing the other things that these people teach us. Okay. So one last question. If someone has, they got the D levels up, they've got their Bs in, is there something that can affect those two things being in good level to convert into acetylcholine. Is there anything in between that conversion? Um, that's, that's an excellent question. <laughs> I, I would direct you to my website because okay. there's a lot of written material there. Right sleep is really not just about, it's not a vitamin recipe. There's a lot more to it. And there's a lot that's about a timeline about how long you take B50, when you have to stop it, why you have to stop it. Because if you're taking extra and then your bugs come back and make the normal amount without you realizing it, you're on twice the amount you should be on. And then you have too much acetylcholine and then you won't sleep again. Oh, so there's an aspect of a timeline. There's also, once you start sleeping better, if you've been deficient for 10 or 15 or 20 years, you have 20 years of repairs that have not been done. What you're really asking for when you say, I want to sleep normally again is, is it possible for me to go back and make up 20 years of repair? Because the brain really remembers every single thing it didn't do in that 20 years. When it gets to the point that it feels like it's done nightly maintenance correctly, it's done all of its tasks, it actually starts to ask for more B vitamins. So there's an aspect of this that's very complex that happens six months into it. 
wow. where the sleep disorder comes back again and the pain yeah. comes back again and you actually have to add more vitamins. That means this is a much bigger picture than what yes. we've just gone through is really complicated, okay? Yeah. yeah. It's really, it's introducing potential ideas, but the reason why there's a workbook that takes you through an entire year of what to do yes. is that this is complicated and you have to pay attention to what your body tells you. And then you have to say, what we're used to is I measure a level and I tell you to take this. This is not that. I can measure the D level and I can tell you 60 days where you need to be. But after that, it's all my body says X now, this, and I give this and my complaint goes away and then it comes back later. Do I, does it mean I need to take it away? Yeah, it usually does. So there's a healing aspect that means you better come off those supplements at the end because they'll cause the same problem at the end when you don't need it anymore. That idea does not seem foreign to you because you're used to working with hormones. Yeah, yeah. Hormones like to be in this nice little narrow band. Sweet spot. Go too yeah. high, go too low, you both get screwed, okay? Yeah. That is very different than the way we pictured vitamins. Vitamins, that word comes out and you're like, what's the dose? What's the sign of toxicity? It turns out vitamins act just like those hormones do. It wants a specific amount in specific parts of your body. And if you give it too much, it's going to be just as cranky as not enough. That is a really different way to look at it. And that's why there's a whole website dedicated to it. Yes. And so you have this workbook. So for everybody that's listening, it's a, it's a program, correct? Yes. It takes you through a year. Yes. It takes you through a whole year. There's also some videos about pregnancy, about fertility, pregnancy, and a separate set of videos about how to do this with children wow. at certain age groups. Wow. And so we can find this on your website. Yes. And on the people... homepage, scroll down, you'll see the workbook and the video. Okay, perfect. And so for everybody, I'm going to link to the page in the show notes. Um, I'm, I am planning on getting it because it sounds amazing. I just want to know it's such this, um, this is so much information. Like, I feel like we could have done about 10 different podcasts with everything that we just talked about. It could have gone I off in so many off. directions. Yes. You you I know. You didn't come back around to that. But the really exciting thing was when the D failed and we started to add the B50 and we get the bugs back, then I start to have women coming back at the third month and going, my headaches are better. I'm sleeping better. And I lost 15 pounds, which is the part that I was like, well, what? The first question was, why do they get fat after having babies? That's not right. Okay. Yes. Why so does that common. happen? Yeah. Yeah. So getting the microbiome back is the really important piece to getting your body into a better metabolic place. There are many people who have tried all sorts of diets and exercise that have not worked for them. And it's because their microbiome is not right. It, their microbiome is still in winter mode winter store fat mode. You have to fix that for you to be able to see the fat come off. And so your program will help treat the microbiome of the gut too, and how to do that. So do you, do you recommend certain diets and stuff in the program? No, nope, I don't nope. feel that I'm an expert in that. What okay. I want for people is this piece. I'm the only one talking about this piece. Yeah. Microbiome back. It's pretty simple. You get your D over 40 and you take B15 and you stop it at three months. But once that's there, then you're going to start to see other metabolic things happen. All of the hormone stuff that you work in are also tied into this because there's a link between the microbiome and, sleep the, hormones. and the hormonal system. If you don't get into deep sleep, you don't get the right hormonal um, secretion, no matter yeah. what, you know, unless you're doing it artificially, all of our hormonal systems are run in deep sleep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the endocrinologists, the neuro, neurologists, the, what's the gut people? The, the, GI, the, the yeah. gastroenterologists, they all need to start speaking with one another. <laughs> this well, is all interconnected. Yeah, yeah Sarah, unbelievable. You're doing a great job. I really like your website. And I think that this, this will fit really naturally in what you're doing. Oh, will it ever? I honestly hear Stasha on a daily basis, almost from all my clients, how sleep is a problem. And it's, you know, obviously very near and dear to me. So it's, you know, my dad, even he's, he had the same thing. He happened, his switch went on and he hasn't been able to sleep for 20 years. Like, so the whole thing, I, I can't wait to share this with him and 
do it myself. So I'm excited. So thank you so much for coming on the show. <laughs> I think, I think we might have to have you back again. I'm happy to come back. That's what happened most of the time. And we can talk. <laughs> I can show you some slides and do, you know, if you want to go a little bit more in detail, because your site is yeah. really a little bit more about detailed biochemistry. So if you want to do some stuff with slides where we, we hone in on certain things, let's do that. later. I would love it. Yes. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time and for coming right. on the show. Thanks, Karen. Bye-bye.